Here is no water, but only rock. Rock and no water in the sandy road. The road winding above the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock. Dead mountain mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit. Here one can neither stand, nor lie, nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were the sound of water only, not the cicada, the dry grass singing, but the sound of water over a rock, where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 but there is no water. One of the more uh, trite uh, or obvious um, observations of literary criticism is that T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, deals with fertility. Specifically, the water is a symbol of fertility. Of course, it also functions as a symbol of baptism, and the, the two ideas are sort of uh, related in the poem. And so, I thought it was intensely relevant to the, to the topic at hand today, which is the abortion crisis as it's coming to a head now in the country. Now, I'm not particularly interested in talking about uh, individual laws. Uh, you know, I'm not interested in talking about policy decisions like should we allow for uh, exceptions for cases of rape and incest, or things like that. I'm, I'm not interested in talking about that. I'm more interested in talking about abortion as a societal phenomenon, um, something that affects the whole society in a certain way. And uh, to do this, I want to take a more wide or orbital view of abortion, if you will, because I understand that you know, uh, it, when you get into the weeds with individual cases, if you individualize it, which is really easy to do when you're talking about abortion, it makes it kind of hard to uh, look at the thing as as it is. Um, you know, so that that's what I'm trying to do today. Uh, so, abortion really comes about. I mean, it's it's always existed in a sense, right? You know. Um, uh, in pagan cultures, it was perfectly acceptable sometimes to, um, you know, if you if you didn't want an infant, you'd carry it to term, and then you'd take it into the woods and leave it to die. Uh, so that would be, I guess, an early form of late-term abortion. Uh, but, and so abortion's always been a thing. But our societies have never really been so fundamentally and radically shaped by abortion uh, until the sexual revolution, or really an, until the, the beginning of modernity uh, in the early 1900s. As, and it represents a sea change because it comes along in, in rising in popularity uh, with the pill, basically. And what abortion in combination with the pill, you know, abortion sort of as a backstop or a final solution, if you will, uh, for failures of the pill, what it really does is it puts humanity in complete control of their sexuality. And, you know, people haven't wrestled with, I think enough, just how destructive it is for human beings to be in control of something like that. Because human sexuality, although it's a human trait, uh, is also a force of nature. And so people say sometimes, for instance, that uh, it would be really great if human beings could control the weather. That way, you know, we we wouldn't have hurricanes that would hit islands and kill thousands of people. And we, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, tornadoes that rip up trailer parks in Oklahoma. And that's the idea, right? 
that if you could control the weather, you could stop all the bad things from happening. Um, but let's say we did do that, and we did start messing with the weather. And, you know, I, I think... I think it's pretty obvious that we would end up doing something, you know, far worse to ourselves than whatever the tornado could do in Oklahoma. And abortion is is kind of like that. It's a sign of human hubris where we say that, you know, we are the ultimate arbiters of human sexuality. And the carnage from this kind of thinking is immense, you know, and in just the United States alone, since 73, there have been something like 50 million abortions. And that's those are the kind of casualties that you would see from the worst war in human history. It's literally worse than the worst war in human history. You know, and you think about when people came back from World War Two, or sorry, from World War One, although also World War Two, when people came back from World War One and they thought about how all these young men were just fed into a meat grinder, and they died and they never came back, um, there was a real sense of tragedy, a real sense of loss, and that's part of what you know helped to uh, accelerate the shattering of tradition and the shattering of society that accompanied uh, our slide into modernity. And so just imagine that kind of trauma, except far, far worse, but nobody seems to comprehend, nobody seems to understand, because these people were killed in the womb before they had a chance to make that kind of impact on other people. I think it's interesting uh, that in the modern world we worship, essentially, at the idol of infertility. You know, in, in the modern world we wish for everything to be like the wasteland that T.S. Eliot talks about, the, the sandy crags, no water anywhere. But in the ancient world, I mean, they worshipped goddesses that brought fertility in all forms. Uh, fertile harvests, obviously, fertile livestock, but also fertile wives. Uh, you know, people in the ancient world, and especially early Christians, were open to all the gifts of life. It was a attitude of welcoming fertility, in a sense of welcoming the water, to use T.S. Eliot's um, device. And, of course, in welcoming the water to welcome baptism. And, you know, in contrast, today's culture worships an idol of infertility. And, as a result, they've made a holocaust of the unborn. And so I want to take these, these two fundamental attitudes and just sort of put them together. You know, put them side by side. And on the one hand, you have an attitude of control. You have an attitude of trying to harness nature for the will of man. It's almost sort of a, it's almost sort of a Faustian kind of spirit, where you know we're going to take control of this faculty that we, you know, for the longest time didn't have complete control over, and you know we're we're going to use it to do what, to seek Epicurean pleasure perhaps. Um, the motivations are different for every person, but I can tell you there are no good motivations for having an abortion. And so you, you juxtapose that sort of understanding of the world, that sort of control and domination perspective of the world with this other perspective of waiting for the rains to come, praying for the rains to come. It's almost like two farmers and one farmer decides that he doesn't want to grow his crops. So he sprays pesticides and weed killer on his cornfield until it withers up and it dies. And the other farmer, of course, is, well, he's waiting for the rains to come. And so... I want to challenge the culture. I want to challenge 
Catholics especially, to be that kind of person who is open to the experience of rain, which is water from heaven.